Before we did that, I had to make sure where Curtis was at. I didn't want him hitting his head on the thing over when he did it. <laughs> Amen. Good to have each of you with us. As I said, we have Brother Scott Miller and his wife Patty with us. And, uh, we've been friends for years, uh, worked in ministry together down in southeast Missouri, and, and Scott's assistant pastor there at uh, Victor Baptist Temple, and, and we just appreciate them so greatly, and, and we're going to have him come preach for us. Thank you, brother. All right, great to be here this morning. You glad you're in the house of God? Yeah, yeah man. Some of you are. Some of you just need to get right with God. Amen. <laughs> Uh, it's great to be here. My wife spoke to the ladies, and I kept hearing, you know, all these wonderful things about her. And some lady said, you going to give us that devotion again this morning? And uh, no, no, she's not going to do that again this morning. All right. But uh, anyway, it's a wonderful opportunity to be here. I love the choir song. Uh, I led the, I'm the choir director at Victory, and we sang that song a long time ago. And Miss Janine was the pianist back then. So she's a longtime pianist. You have a wonderful pianist uh, there. So anyway, uh, Brother Rodney and I worked together for nine years. And, uh, you know, you become like what your idol is. And he was my idol. And so I've become <laughs> like my idol. <laughs> I tell you what, it's easier to take care of your hairdo that way, uh, except when you hit your head. That's the only time it's not good to be this way. Take your Bibles, turn to Mark chapter 5 this morning. Mark chapter not, 5. I was in Sunday school and Brother Brian did a wonderful job. He talked about the fact that he is a fast speaker. I think I'm faster. He, he, did, he was slow this morning, actually. And uh, I notice how fast you sing the songs this morning. Uh, I'm from the north. Uh, originally from Michigan, and uh, we sing songs fast up there. And so I feel like I'm in northern Missouri because you sing things fast, and that's, that's all right. It's great to be able to have a song in our heart because of what the Lord Jesus has done for us. He's changed our life, changed our direction. I'm glad this morning I'm saved. You know, if this is your first time here, first time to hear the gospel, uh, it, being saved is the best thing in all the world. It, you, you get the best of both worlds. You know where you're headed, and even though the world gets worse and worse, we know that this is not all there is. Because uh, eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ is the best thing ever. Let's look at Mark chapter 5 this morning. Mark chapter 5, verse 24 is where we'll start. I want to preach you this morning a message called Touching Jesus. In Mark chapter 4, or Mark chapter 5, verse 24, we find here that Jesus is following Jairus. He's going to his house to uh, raise his sick daughter from the dead. She is dead, and wherever Jesus goes and wherever there's death, it doesn't stay. He raised her from the dead. So he's going through the streets of Jerusalem. And uh, the Bible says in verse 24, And Jesus went with him, that's Jairus, and much people followed him and thronged him. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood 12 years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus immediately, knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned, about, turned him about in, in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest this multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And he looked around about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Now, Heavenly Father, we're sure grateful and thankful for what we've seen and heard this morning. Thank you for the music that we've uplifted to your name. It's a sacrifice to you, the song of our heart, because you're worthy of honor and praise and glory. And we're thankful that there's victory in you, the Lord Jesus Christ. And now as we open your word, it is eternal, it is alive, it's living. And uh, you've given it to us. To know, so that we can understand how we can know we're on our way to heaven. So we can know how to live our life in a wise way. 
so that we're prepared for eternity and prepared for the judgment seat of Christ. And now, Lord, I ask you to speak to hearts this morning. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you, Lord, for being so good to us. It's just a great thing to be saved. Thank you for the, the, just knowing your presence is here today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You know, wherever Jesus went, there were multitudes that followed him. And several in that multitude followed him for different reasons. Some people followed Jesus for the meat, for the food that he provided. And you remember with me that uh, he fed 5,000 people with uh, the loaves and the fishes. And those people that followed, that were at that meeting, at that food fest, if you want to say, uh, they were so excited about the fact that Jesus had fed them. And when Jesus sent his disciples in the boat to go to the other side, you know what they went through. You know the storm, and Jesus walked on the water. He met them. And when they got to the other side, there were other boats that had followed Jesus as well. And they were on the other side, and they were following Jesus because of the food. And in John chapter number 6, and verse 27, he said this to them. He said, labor not for the meat which perisheth. That's just regular food. But he said, labor but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give you. He said, that's what you need to labor for, is for salvation, for the real food, the real meat. And Jesus said, I'm the real meat. My flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He said that later on. So he, he, he condemned them in a way. He said, you're, you're searching for the wrong thing. You're searching for a free meal. And, and today, that's one thing that, that you know, people look after. We, we ask ourselves, what are we going to have for lunch today? What are we going to eat? Uh, I call my wife at night, and I, I say, she says, I know why you're calling. Because what are we going to eat tonight? So that's the way we are. But Jesus says, don't, don't labor for that kind of meat. Labor for the real meat. Labor for, for the truth. But another reason why people followed Jesus was because of the miracles that he performed. And they wanted to see what he, he done. And he did some miraculous things. And people followed him and were amazed that you know, the dead were raised to life, that the crippled were healed and they could walk, the blind could see, the deaf could hear, and all those kind of things. So they followed him for the miracles. But you know what? There were some other people that followed Jesus, not because of the meat, not because of the miracles, but because he was the master. Amen just for himself. Amen. And that's what we find here this morning is that there were people following Jesus. And in that crowd, there were people that were following him because maybe he's going to feed us again today. Or maybe we're going to see some miracle performed by him. But really, there were some people in that crowd that were following him because they'd heard some things about him that were true, because he was the master. And this morning, we're not going to focus on the crowd. We're going to fo focus on the individual in that crowd. Because you see, the masses are made up of individuals, of individual people. And this woman this morning had a need. And the Bible says that she reached out and touched Jesus. And Jesus said, somebody had touched me. You know, this morning there's a lot of us here. But there's somebody here. The, the, the reason why you're here is because you want to meet with Jesus. So let's look at this, this woman this morning. First of all, I want to call your attention to the, her desperate con condition. Her desperate condition. The Bible tells us here that this dear woman was in a desperate strait. She was at the end of her rope, if you want to put it that way. She had tried a lot of things. She'd gone to doctors, doctor th this and doctor that, and, and surely she was a woman. So some dear ladies that she knew said, well, you ought to try this. You ought to try that. And she'd had opinions from these people and that people. And the Bible tells us that nothing worked. Nothing worked for her. And she, she was suffering. The Bible says she suffered many things. Many things of many physicians there in verse 26. And she was at her wit's end. She was broke, if you want to say it that way. She had nothing at all. But somehow, somehow she'd heard about Jesus. Now, you know what? Back in those days, they didn't have Facebook. They didn't have Google. They didn't have all these things you could look up. But word still spread. <laughs> You know, that's the amazing thing about humanity is we can tell this story and tell that person and you tell somebody and they tell somebody else and, and word spreads quickly. And this dear lady, she had heard about Jesus and she heard about, you know, the blind seeing again. 
She heard about the cripples being able to walk again. She heard about the people being raised from the dead. And she said, you know, that's who I need to see. Amen. I need to see Jesus. Yeah. I need to get to Jesus. And she said, you know, that's the one I need to get to. But you know what? The fact of the matter is she was too embarrassed. She was too embarrassed to tell her whole, whole story about what had happened in her life, of all the money she spent to get well and nothing worked. But she said, if I can get to Jesus, if I can get to the great physician, I know I could be made whole. I know that something can happen in my life. And so she was in a de desperate strait, and she was thinking, you know, if, if I can get to Jesus, if I, if I can just, not even just talk to him, but if I can just touch his clothes, if I can just touch his clothes, I knew I'll be made whole. She had faith. And, and you know, before any of us in this room ever do anything, sin or do something good, we always have to premeditate it. We always think about it. And so no doubt, every day she'd get up, I wonder where Jesus is today. I wonder if he's close to my town today. I wonder how, how close he is, you know, because she was thinking, if I just can get to Jesus, I can be made whole. Right. And so, you know what, the fact of the matter is, it was a difficult situation for her. She was in a desperate situation. I mean, she was probably going to die. She'd been weakened by all this loss of blood. And yet she said, it's difficult, but I'm going to get to him. And one day she learned that Jesus was coming by. He was coming by her town. And she said, this is the day. This is the day for me. I'm going to get to Jesus today. But the Bible tells us as Jesus was going, there was this throng. The Bible says there, the people thronged him. There was a throng. Now the Holy Spirit, under inspiration, gave to Mark and to Luke, because this is also this story, this account is given to us in Luke about the fact that there was, the people were thronging him. And the word that, that Mark uses here for throng means it was, he was compressed on all sides. I mean, there was a lot of people around Jesus. Now here in this country, you know, we all want our personal space, don't we? And when somebody invades that personal space, you always do this, uh, okay. There's a fellow in our church, bless his heart, his name's Jeff Davis. He's not a confederate either, all right? There's a Jeff Davis. And Brother Davis, when he talks to you, he gets real close to you, you know, and he gets intense. He looks you right in the eye. And I find myself sometimes, okay, Jeff, you know, I want my personal space. But in the Orient, it's not that way. People get really close to each other. I know uh, you may be familiar with a fellow named uh, uh, Matt Stallman. Brother Stallman is, uh, was a missionary in Africa, and now he, he heads up some, some missionary endeavors. But he said one time he was in, in the, the Orient or the Middle East, and he said he was at a church gathering with Christians, and he said there was a brother in Christ who just laid his head on his shoulder. And you know what we think? Like, okay, this is strange. But he says, it's not strange in the Orient to do that. If you remember that G John laid his head on Jesus' breast. He got close to Jesus. And so in the Orient, it's not unusual for people to be really close. Maybe you've been at a ball game for the Cardinals or some other place. And there's people on every side. Still in that crowd, you, you kind of have that personal space. But there was no personal space. He was compressed. There was everybody around him. Luke goes on, and, and the word that the Holy Spirit gave Luke to use was, it means to, to throng, is to strangle completely, to drown, to crowd. So Jesus was surrounded. He's following Jairus to his house, and everybody's around. And so he's compressed. There was a mass of humanity encompassing Jesus as he moved through those narrow streets. So you see, the fact of the matter was very hard for this woman to get to Jesus. It was not going to be easy for her to get behind and touch his garments, but she continued on. In spite of that, her desperate situation, her condition, the navigating of those masses, she was going to get to him no matter what. Now, you see, she was not content with being in the same location as Jesus. She was not content with being on the same street as Jesus. She was not content like Zac Zacchaeus just to get a glimpse of Jesus. She was not content to be 25 or 50 feet from Jesus. 
She said, I got to get to Jesus. I got to touch his garment because if I don't touch Jesus, I'm still going to be the same way as I am. And I don't want to be this way anymore. I believe if I can just touch him, I will be made completely whole. Amen. She said, I got to get there. And so there was a difficulty to get to her. You know, I, I can imagine in my sanctified imagination how difficult it was to get to her or get to Jesus. The first thing I think about was, you know, she, if she, she was trying to get to him. I'm sure she was squeezing through there. She got a shove and an ugly look. Woman, what are you doing? What are you trying to, you know, and she was trying to get through that crowd. Some of you have been maybe in a situation like that. I remember a fellow in our church when uh, George W. Bush was down in, P P in Poplar Bluff. There was a mass of humanity there to see the president. And this fellow in our church said, I'm going to get to him. And he crossed some boundaries to get there. And he got real close. And I don't know how he did it, but he got to shake the president's hand. He said, I'm going to get to him. I'm going to get to him. And that's the way this woman was. No matter how the look she got, no matter anything else, she said, I'm going to touch his garment. And she, she did. Nevertheless, she pressed on. You know, I'm reminded of Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13 in this instance. Jesus said, and ye, or the God said to Jeremiah, ye, and ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. It was in her heart. I want to get to the Lord Amen. and I want to touch him. Right. And so the Bible says that Jesus, of course, her, her persistence was rewarded. Her persistence in getting there, all of a sudden she's right there by him. Are you there with me in your imagination this morning? She's right there, right behind him. This is the moment. She reaches out, touches him. And immediately, and Mark is that way. Jesus immediately did this, and straightway he went here. And this is what he did because he was a servant. And she touched him, and immediately she knew in her body she was made completely whole. Amen. The blood was stopped. She said, I've never felt like this before. I've never been this way before. And when she did it, the Bible tells us that Jesus had a virtue go out of him. He noticed her faith. He noticed what was going on. And he felt that power go out of him. That's what the word is for virtue is dunamis. It's a power that went out of him. Power went out of him to heal her. He took notice of it and he said, somebody's touched me. Now imagine, we're crowded on every side. And in, in Luke's gospel, uh, it's Peter, the spokesman, who speaks up and says, Master, come on. I mean, look, we're, we're crowded here. And you say, somebody touched me? What are you thinking? Ah, there were people that were touching Jesus because it was close. But there wasn't anybody that reached out in faith to touch him for healing. Amen. And she was there on purpose. Amen. She had a desire. Amen. And Jesus said, I noticed that. Amen. Now, think about this. Jesus looked around to see. And he didn't ask that question because he didn't know who it was. He knew who that woman was. He knew who she was. And he said, somebody touched me. And the Bible says, she, knowing she couldn't be hid. Well, of course she couldn't be hid. How are you going to run away? And if she tried to, she would have been noticed. So she just kind of stood still. If somebody touched me. And finally, he knew it was her. She had to come forward. And the Bible says, she came forward. She fell at his feet. And she told him the whole story. She was embarrassed about it. There's some things you don't talk about in public. But she told him the whole thing in front of everybody. And look at what Jesus says. Daughter. Notice the scripture there. It says, daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. It wasn't touching my clothes. That's not what it was. It's your faith in the fact of what I can do for you. What I could do. What doctors could not do, I can do. Because he's God. Yes. And he said, thy faith hath made thee whole. And then he says to her, go in peace. Now, can I say this morning that the Bible says she was made whole. It wasn't just a physical thing. It was a spiritual thing. Amen. Sure. She was made completely whole. She recognized that Jesus wasn't just some, 
famous person, some great healer, that he was the Lord Jesus Christ. He's God. Amen. She was made completely whole. And that day in her life was the best day ever because she'd been born again. She'd been healed, yes, but she'd been healed spiritually too. Amen. And that's what made the difference. And so let me make some application here just to, to all this and then we'll, and then we'll go home because I know some of you look for this. Well, when, when we're going home, you know, I was in a church service one time and, and the pastor went longer than he was supposed to. And this fella said to his wife, boy, he's worn, wound up today. Hey, you know what? If you're talking about the right thing, if you're preaching about Jesus Christ, you can just... Yeah. Well, the fact of the matter is you watch TV movies for an hour and a half and you never say, wow, this movie's wound up. No, you just sit there and watch it. And the same thing, it, 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 it's, all, it's better here because you're getting the truth here. You get the truth from this book right here. And so the preacher goes two minutes over 12. It's okay. It's all right. Your food will keep, you know. Remember, we always want the food. Don't worry about the food. You want the master. You want the master. So this morning, you know what? The fact of the matter is all of us are in a desperate condition. Yes. We're in a desperate condition. And like that woman in our account, the, perhaps this morning you heard and you know within yourself that something's not right. Something's not right. And you found out what that is because somebody told you the truth. Somebody told you that you're a sinner. The Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's not one of us in this room that is absolutely perfect. We're all sinners. We've all fallen short of God's perfection. God says you have to be perfect to be saved. You have to be perfect to go to heaven. And none of us do that because the Bible says in Adam all die. And Adam all have sinned. He's our federal head. When Adam and Eve ate that fruit of the garden that God said not to eat, it, it, it brought sin into the world and it brought sin into humanity. The problem with us today is that we're all sinners. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. It's a sin problem today. You know, the federal government could learn some things of, uh, 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 from the church and from God's word. The problem is, is not the environment. It's not that. It's not this uh, uh, race or that race. It's sin. That's the problem today. And all of us are infected by that. All of us have a serious condition. And the fact of the matter is the wrath of God is over us and the wrath of God is beneath us. And if it weren't for the long suffering and mercy of God this morning, you would drop off into a devil's hell this morning because all are condemned. Everyone is condemned. Not we're condemned already. Not in the future, but right now you're condemned. You're a condemned man. You're a condemned woman. And so we're in a desperate condition. And some people, you see, they try to try things to try and take care of that sin problem. They say, well, if I'll go to church, I'll feel better. Now, the fact of the matter is church doesn't make you feel better. <laughs> if you hear the truth of this book right here, it's not going to make you feel better this morning. It's going to make you feel condemned and worse because you're a sinner. Some people try self-help books, you know. Well, if I read this book, it'll help me. No, it won't help you. You could spend money on books to try and help yourself, but it won't help you at all. Some people, you know, they, they, they uh, try, try a lot of things. They, they try to get some relief, and there's no relief outside of Jesus. You've got to get to Jesus. And that woman, like, like that woman with the issue of blood, this morning you've heard about Jesus. You've heard about, you've heard the lingo, you've heard about being saved and being born again. You're saying, well, I wonder what, what that is. But the fact of the matter is it's the truth. Jesus does save. He can save you from your sinful condition. He can make you completely whole, just like this woman in our count this morning. And can I say, too, that there needs to be, and I'm preaching the church now, there needs to be in our, this community, and this is a good church, and you have a pastor who preaches the Word of God. You have Bible teachers that preach the Word of God. There needs to be in this community a church where people know, if I go to that church, I can touch Jesus. Amen. I will know that I'll meet Jesus. Amen. I'll know that I'll be spoken to because of the Word of God. I can meet Him there. 
And there needs to be a church like that because we're living in the last days. We need a church where Christ is uplifted, a church where folks hear the gospel truth that Jesus can save them from their sin. They need to hear that. And you know, it's a sad day when folks can go to church and they can hear a message and they can sing a song and they can be around Jesus but never touch Jesus. Because the church today has a form of godliness. But what did Paul tell Timothy about that? From such, turn away. Get away from that. Don't, you don't want that old dead religion. Because dead religion does not change lives. Dead religion turns people off. Dead religion is just what it is. If a church gets like that, it needs to close the doors. It's not a testimony to the Lord Jesus Christ. So church, we need, to, we need to be a church where people know if they go there, they're going to find Jesus. And they can touch him and they can be made completely whole. So this morning, friend, if you're here without Christ, you're in a desperate condition. And to, maybe today you came to overcome something. You can overcome it. Like that woman, uh, sometimes you have to overcome the religious crowd. That woman was in a mass of humanity. She had to overcome some things to get to Jesus. And you overcame some things this morning. You know, uh, maybe there's some folks that told you, oh, you don't want to go to Calvary Baptist Church because those folks up there are just a little different. <laughs> That's okay. Amen. Because we are a peculiar people. And we're zealous of good works. That's a good thing if people say, you don't want to go to that church. That means maybe they're just telling you the truth. So you do want to go there. And some of you this morning overcame that obstacle of coming to Calvary Baptist Church. And you're here this morning. And we're glad you are. Yeah. But some of you this morning, you had to overcome your sinful flesh. You know, our sinful flesh, the Bible calls that the natural man. And it doesn't want you to go to Jesus. In our flesh, we don't want Jesus. We want to do it our way. You know, I can get saved my way. I can do good works. That'll get me saved. I can go to church. I can give money. That'll work out. It won't work out. Amen. Good works will not save you. No, it's Jesus that saves you. Amen. So you've got to overcome that flesh. And maybe you've tried to get here sometimes in the past, but something's always come up. You know, you've tried to get to Calvary Baptist, but, oh, we got this. Oh, we got that. Oh, oh, oh. Or maybe this week you even got out a Bible you got at home, and you started reading it. You started trying to discover about this Jesus that people, folks have been talking about. But, oh, the phone rang, and, oh, I don't have time for that. Something stopped you from getting to Jesus. But can I say this morning that you, at least this morning you are here, and you're not here by accident. You're here on purpose. Maybe somebody invited you, but you say, there's something about that person that invited me that I want to investigate. I want to know more about and it's Jesus. It's the Lord Jesus. So, you know, you're here, you've come to church, and you need to get Jesus. You don't need religion. You need Jesus this morning. You know, wouldn't it be nice if here at Calvary Baptist there was a box outside the front door and it said, cares box? You know, because we all have cares, don't we? We've got burdens, don't we? And, and outside there was this cares box, right there by those blue benches. And, and it would be neat if you could just bring in your cares and just drop them in the cares box. And it's like, oh, whew, that's gone. And just walk away. But can I tell you this morning, the fact is, if you were to do that, you wouldn't be healed. If you, if you could just drop your cares because this world is full of cares and troubles. You drop them in the box, you'd get more when you left. But can I tell you this morning that if you get to Jesus, he will take all your cares upon him. He'll bear your burden. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, the Bible says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That woman in her account this morning, she didn't have peace. But when she got to Jesus, she got peace. When she got to Jesus, she got rest. When she got to Jesus, she was happier than she had ever been in 12 years. The burden was lifted because he took her burden. He took her, he took it all. And she left free. She left free. In, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, the Bible says, Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. You know, there's some delight, delightful results that can be yours today in coming to Jesus. First of all, you've got to come to him and confess some things. 
confess that you're a sinner. Remember that woman had to confess in front of everybody. Thank the Lord you don't have to spill everything in front of everybody this morning. But you come to the Lord Jesus and say, Jesus, I am a sinner. I'm a sinner. I know I, I can't save myself, but you're the only one that can do it. And you, you just say, Lord, I'm a sinner, and I believe that you're the Savior. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. You shed your blood and took my place because I should have died. I should have, to, <laughs> I should have to pay for my sin. But can I say this morning, if any one of us in this room tried to pay for our sin, it would, lend us, it would land us in hell. Yeah. And we'd be keep paying and keep paying and keep paying and never get out. Never. Because you can't do it. But we have a substitute, the Lord Jesus Christ, that did that for you. Took your place. He took, the Bible says that God laid on him, on Jesus, the iniquities of us all. So he took my sin. He took my punishment. He took my place. So I, if I come to him and say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you're the, the Christ. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I believe that you're, you're the Savior of the world. Would you, I believe that. Would you save me? He'll say, yes, I will. I paid the debt. I paid it all. And I did it for you. I did it for you. So you confess, confess that. The Bible says that, thank God that while we are, are yet sinners... That Christ, our God, is rich in mercy. He's rich in mercy. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He paid our sin debt and forgiven it. So that if we come to him by faith, we can be made cleansed. We can be made completely whole. And my sin is never to be brought up before, me, before God again. He sees Jesus Christ's perfection covering me. I'm glad for that. So if you, like that woman, will pour out your heart to God and tell him all the truth, he'll say to thee, thy faith, sir, thy faith, ma'am, have made thee whole. It's made you whole. And can I say, when you're made completely whole, you don't, you, you, you don't want to sin anymore. You don't want to because you're made completely whole. And he changes your life. So a persistence to touch Jesus will always be rewarded. It will always be rewarded. And, and the Bible says here of that woman, or about Jesus, that power went out of him. There was, a, there was power that went out of him. And can I say that Jesus, the power is still going out of Jesus today to save folks? And it will never run out. It will never run out. Annie Flynn, she wrote this hymn. And some of you know it. It goes like this. His love has no limit. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundary known unto men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. All of us in this room, I trust, are saved. But I, I, I have to say that probably some of you are not born again. But those of us who have received his salvation, we can say he'll do it for you. He can save you today. You can know for sure that you're on your way to heaven. You can have the burden of sin removed and you can say, I'm glad I'm saved. Amen. There's a dear woman that my wife got to minister to. Uh, she had cancer and she'd had it a long time. She was religious, but she wasn't saved. And Patty got to to minister to her and witness to her. And she was finally in Barnes Hospital. And she never would leave Barnes Hospital again. But she called one night. And as my wife was talking to her on the phone, you know how it goes. Well, you, you need to be saved. You need to trust Jesus. You need to give him all your heart. And this dear lady, Stephanie, put her faith and trust in Jesus that night on the telephone. And she said, uh, she said, but Patty said, you want to talk to my husband? I said, yeah, I'll talk to Stephanie. So I talked to her. She said, I just feel so light. She said, the burden's been lifted. And I said, Jesus does that for you. He'll take the burden away and you'll be made completely whole. And though Stephanie never went home to Piedmont, she went home to heaven and she got to see Jesus. Amen. Oh, to God, it happened sooner that she trusted Jesus sooner. Sir, ma'am, this morning, you're here. It's no accident you're here this morning. It's, there's no accident. Somebody invited you, but the Holy Spirit draw, drew you in this morning. 
And you say, if I can get to that church, if I can get to Jesus, not, it's not this church that saves you. It's not Baptists that save you. It's not that. It's Jesus. Amen. If you can just touch Jesus this morning, you can be made completely whole. Okay. Can I ask you this morning, will Jesus say, somebody touched me? Somebody touched me. For those of us who knew, know the Lord Jesus as our Savior, there was a time when we trusted and touched Jesus. Amen. I was five years old, almost six years old. I realized I was a sinner. I realized Christ died on the cross for my sins. And I said, Lord Jesus, save me. And at five years old, almost six, the Lord did save me. And you know what my first thought was? I went out to play. We had these cardboard blocks that we play with. And I went out there and I said to myself, I wonder if Jesus is pleased with what I'm doing right now. Kids that age don't think like that. It's an evidence of the new birth. Evidence of being born again. It changes you. Changes your life. Changes how you think. Changes your destination. And so this morning, you're not here by accident. You're here because there's just something about the Lord Jesus. And if you reach out to touch him, he'll touch you. He will touch you. So call on Jesus today. Reach out by faith. And he will save you. He's got sufficient power in all that he did. Because the Bible says, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. He is the one that you need to see to get saved today. Won't you do that? We're going to have an invitation in just a second. That means we'll probably stand up, we'll bow our heads, and close our eyes, and the instruments will play. I'd, I'd invite the instrumentalists to come up right now. They're going, to, they're going to play. And as they play, God's spoken to your heart. And you say, man, I'm desperate. I've tried everything, tried to be good, but it's not worked. Will you this morning just come right up here? Brother Hagin will be here, somebody will be here to take this Bible and to show you Jesus. And you reach out by faith and touch him. And I'll guarantee you this morning, you'll leave differently than when you came in this morning. Like Stephanie, you'll say, you know what? The sky's a little bluer. I feel a little lighter. And it's because the burden of sin has been removed. It's taken away. Won't you, won't you come today? Let's stand together. Heavenly Father, we're thankful this morning for the illustrations you give us, for the accounts you give us in your word of people that were desperate and came to you. This dear woman, I believe we'll see her again. We'll see her someday. She had no name, but you knew her. And folks here this morning, some of these folks, I don't know their name. I don't know who's here. I don't know who's saved, who's lost, but you do. And you're looking. And you see them. And by faith, may they reach out and touch you today. May they truly trust you as their personal Savior Holy Spirit, I pray that you remove all hindrances, anything, their flesh, the devil, that would stop them from coming this morning to, to you to be saved. Now with the heads bowed and eyes closed, the instruments instrument play.